Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Mark McCrendle, how are you? Great, thanks, Jeremy. Good to be with you. I'm sorry to ring you on a, a public holiday, but thank you for making way for me. No, uh, great to chat. How did you? How how does anyone know exactly what day the population is going to uh, click over to another million? Well, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has some pretty good quarterly population updates, which looks at how we're growing and. You know, those two areas are, are births versus deaths. So they look at the natural increase. They look at arrivals versus departures. From a migration perspective, they tally all of that. And so every quarter we get an update. And so based on sort of working out exactly how that flow, that model is is working, we can work out exactly what, which day we hit the, the new milestone. And that was, as you said, on Wednesday, up to 27 million. So do I do I read it right? And uh, Australia does not really have any policy, any population policy. Yeah, there's not t- around. There's no no set ratios as to how we're going to grow natural increase versus overseas migration, uh, and so it just happens how it happens. And that's why in this last twelve months we've just had some crazy new record. We increased by six hundred and twenty four thousand people, which was not only bigger than the previous record, which is all the way back in 2009, but it beat it by 41%. So this is an all-time record at an all-time record rate. And um, and it's just demand and supply. There's not so much government target or policy sitting around it, even though obviously migration, which is the bulk of this growth, is entirely governed through policy settings. Now, that sounds to me numerically about the same size as the population of Canberra. Well, exactly, or Tasmania. We've grown new Tasmania in a year. And, uh, you know, it used to take us about uh, three to four years to add a million people. Uh, We're doing it now every 18 months or so. So it certainly is unprecedented population growth. So what I I read uh, a while back that we would hit a population of uh, 28 million in 2045. That's going to happen next year by the look of it. Exactly right. So we're 20 to 30 years ahead of the models of, of just 20 to 30 years ago. So, uh, and, and of course, this matters because all of the land zoning and uh, planning at local government level, development of hospitals, airports, rail, it's a 20 year time frame to plan that out. They're looking at what the population will be in 20 years. And if, if the population forecasts were so off, or more to the point, if the current population increases have been so rapid, then no wonder we've got some shortfalls and some infrastructure bottlenecks. Indeed. Uh, it doesn't sound like uh, the opposition has a, a philosophy or, a, or, or an approach to this that's any different from the government. Why, why have we allowed ourselves to be governed by people who don't have a plan? Well, they do get a benefit from population growth. It does boost the economy. There is an economic boost that comes from the domestic demand. The universities are loving it because many of these people coming in are, are students, are overseas students, and that's a good earner for the universities and a for for the nation. Um, you've got a lot of businesses, particularly large corporates, that are really relying on overseas migration from a skills perspective and plugging gaps that they're, they're not finding locally. So there's reasons for it, but you know it's, it's at a community level, it's at a local level, it's at those looking to buy a home or or thinking about their kids, yeah. uh, that are suddenly the ones that, that are paying the price for this this record growth. So it's a cost of living. It's a, it's an irritant to the, uh, the the cost of living, which is apparently the uh, the main thing that we are thinking about and worrying about. Well, exactly. It, it certainly drives that. Uh, and, and, you know, if we're wondering why house prices are going up so much and why it's hard to find a rental vacancy. It does come back to this demand way above supply. And even though there's some... Federal government plans to build, you might have heard, you know, 1.2 million homes over the next five years. Well, yeah. you know, the average the average household is 2.5 people in size. You take the 624,000, that means we need another 250,000 homes per year to accommodate the, the recent growth that we've had. And and if you multiply five years of 250,000, that's, that's 1.25 million homes we need just. Are you there, Mark? Uh, Tony, you dropped out. I think we're going to have one of those mornings, you know. 
It just dropped out. I don't know whether we can... Ring him back? Yeah, we'll ring him back. That's probably the idea. There's uh, a lot to talk about today. Um, I couldn't believe the uh, statues and the defacing of monuments that occurred in Melbourne because of, I imagine, Australia Day. Cannot believe that. And yet it's the anniversary of the tall ships coming into Sydney Harbour, which saw a million people come out and applaud. Don't understand what's going on there. Phone's ringing. Um... Are you there, Mark? Mark. Oh, sorry about that. Just lost you. Eh? <laughs> yeah, no, it dropped out. I'm sorry. I'm, I was just saying we have a... I think we're going to have one of those days where everything goes wrong, but never mind. It's Australia Day, and that's good. Yes, uh, that's uh, it. <laughs> what, what would be the ideal population for Australia? Has anybody looked at what the, the optimum is? Well, we could at least start by getting back to what has been the, the recent long-term average, which was more like 230,000 net increase through migration, yeah. uh, maybe up to 235,000 on a bigger year. Now, in the last year, we had 518,000 just through migration. So you, you get a sense as to how far out of the norm we've been. I think if we got back to some of those years, because that's been sustainable now over about 20 years, yeah. uh, and that also allows a bit more of the natural increase to come up. You, you see, right at the time we've got record migration, we've got record low birth rates, and the two are linked. Because if young couples can't afford a home, if they can't afford to move out of their parents, if, they, if they're in a rental apartment, they, they'd love to get a home and, and maybe expand their family but can't afford that, well, no wonder the birth rates are so low and the families are so small. So if we get the migration on a bit more of a sustainable pathway, um, you're more likely to get an increase in, in natural increase and balance out those growth factors. Well, why wouldn't they, if it was a, sort of an unknown as to what the consequences of rampant uncontrolled immigration and population growth would mean, wouldn't it be natural and normal for a government to take it cautiously and say, well, we're going to, we're going to bring this back to a, a level, as you've just said, that we know about, that we can manage comfortably? You would think so, because firstly, the growth that we're seeing at the moment is not particularly popular electorally. You know, people are starting to now feel that we've got too much of a good thing. And we need to get the numbers down. And yet, as you say, you know, on both sides, no one's really talking about getting the numbers to a more sustainable footing. Partly, I think it's because the big end of town and the, the universities and uh, and the, the sort of the, the, the those who benefit economically uh, probably have the year of, of government. Uh, secondly, it, it, no one wants to drift into talking about reducing migration lest it be thrown into the the sort of uh, we're questioning the cultural diversity side of things. And so so that causes some people to pause. No one is. I mean, we found even in our research, when we ask Australians what they think of our, our migration and our cultural diversity, it's very popular. People love it. In fact, almost everyone has come from some place or other. We're all part of that. Um, but when we ask about the numbers, that's when they say, in fact, only 5% said the current numbers, when we put it to them, are, are about right. 95% say they're, they're, they're over. And in fact, most are saying they're far too high compared to what our nation needs. So everyone likes the cultural diversity of this nation and migration, uh, but they just want it in a more sustainable yeah, frame yeah, more. so that we can accommodate the growth. Take it, take it in bite-sized pieces. Don't stick the whole thing in your mouth. I mean, somewhere in the cupboard, there's got to be a full house sign that we can hang out there. <laughs> well, well, yeah. And, and just to, to, you know, growth is a good thing. I mean, we wouldn't want to be in a situation like, well, some nations like Japan, where they're, they're getting close to population contraction. They've got a very rapidly aging population. They've got no natural increase to speak of and no migration um, history either. So so that can create an economic stagnation. We wouldn't want that, but we're not going to get that. I mean, we're, we're, we're growing. We're one of the fastest growing nations in the Western world. Um, we could easily pare back the growth. The models were saying we would probably be around now just under 1% growth. Instead, we're, we're two and a bit times that at 2.4% increase per annum. So that's that's pretty rapid uh, for a, a, a developed uh, nation. We've got lots of room, there's no doubt about that, but people don't want to avail, avail themselves of that. They want to pile into the already crowded cities. That's right. 80% of permanent arrivals end up in Sydney and Melbourne. And so you end up with you know the rising house prices there, the 
densification there yeah. and the infrastructure bottlenecks there. Meanwhile, some of the regions have been calling out for, for growth and, and they benefit from that growth, but you're not getting migration heading to the regions. Now, they've had a bit of a, a, a bonus over the last few years since the pandemic with a lot of um, Australians relocating to regions for lifestyle and affordability uh, motivations. That's been great. But there's certainly more room in the regions, more opportunity to expand and rebalance our population. But it can't just be a story of Sydney or Melbourne um, taking the bulk. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, people say about Adelaide, and I, coming from Sydney, just loved about Adelaide, was the quality of life. And that the, the quality of life seems to have something to do with the number of people. You know, you, you don't want 14, 15 people all trying to get the same parking spot that you want or the same well, seat it, in the theatre or... Uh, exactly right. And and I think South Australia is a great example of sustainable growth. It increased by about 30,000 people in the last year. It, uh, it, it increased by, in percentage terms, 1.7%. Now, that's manageable. That's sustainable. Um, Southeast Queensland is growing by more than twice that, two and a half times that rate. And and it's uh, and and you know Victoria is growing very solidly now. Big growth in in Perth, and so and so it's about growth as as beneficial, of course. Yep. It leads to jobs in construction and and infrastructure and um, and demand, uh, but growth that is manageable. Otherwise, you end up with a red hot economy. Thank you very much for your time, Mark. I much appreciate it. Uh, great to chat, Jeremy. Thank you. All the best, Mark McCrindle, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.